Today's player was one of the most dominant scorers in the history of college basketball, and you would think someone able to score the way he did would be a headache in the NBA if they weren't getting 20 plus shots per game. But that just wasn't the case for Hersey Hawkins, who excelled during his 13 year NBA career because of his ability to cater his game to the stars that he played alongside and always get his points within the flow of the offense, never forcing anything. A man that scored nearly 15,000 points in his career never seems to get brought up when talking about the better two guards in the 90s. So that's what we're going to do today. Time to jog your memory. Hawkins started at Chicago's Westinghouse High School, where according to him, he played primarily at center during his senior year. Standing at just 6'3", and maybe even shorter at that time, it's understandable that he wasn't highly recruited as major schools aren't looking for a center that's the same height as a lot of point guards. And because Hawkins was played at center, he didn't get a chance to show his talent at other positions. Luckily, the then coach of Bradley University, Dick Versace, saw Hawkins playing guard at practice one day. He liked what he saw and offered him a scholarship to be a member of the Bradley Braves. Bradley was a great situation for Hawkins, as he wanted his family to be able to see him play, and it was only three hours away. Hawkins began the 1985 season as a freshman starter. Hawkins would be a part of a starting lineup that consisted of four future NBA players, Boyce Winters, Mike Williams, Jim Less, and himself. Even as a freshman, Hawkins showed his scoring prowess and was second on the team in scoring as the team finished with a 17-13 record and would miss the tournament. For the year, Hawkins would average about 14.5 points, 6 rebounds, and 2.5 assists per game. The 1986 season saw the Braves put up a memorable regular season. The team would go 32-3 and make the tournament, where they would lose to Louisville in the second round. The team was led by Hawkins, Williams, and Less, and Hawkins would up his scoring average by over 4 points per game. Hawkins was showing his all-around scoring ability and was quickly beginning to become one of the top players in the Missouri Valley Conference. For his efforts, Hawkins would receive a first-team all-conference selection, and for the year, Hawkins would average over 18.5 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 3.5 and assists per game. 1987 was much more similar to Hawkins' freshman season in regards to team success, as Les and Williams had left for the NBA, leaving Hawkins as the only future NBA player on the roster, and the team's unquestioned star. Hawkins would level up yet again this season and finish 5th in the nation in scoring, but the Braves would go 17-12 and 12, as they were one of the best scoring offenses in the nation, but also one of the worst scoring defenses. Hawkins would end his year averaging just over 27 points per game, 6.5 rebounds, and 3.5 and assists per game. Hawkins would receive his second selection to the All-Conference First Team, as well as his first Conference Player of the Year award. 1988 was a senior season of the ages for Hawkins and the Braves. Hawkins would once again raise his scoring average over 9 points from the previous season, while leading the Braves to a 26-5 record and a berth in the tournament, where they would unfortunately lose to Auburn in the first round. This season would see Hawkins set some big program records, such as setting Bradley's single-game scoring mark when he scored 63 against Detroit Mercy on February 22nd. Hawkins would also become, and still is, Bradley's all-time leading scorer, and he would become, and still is, the Missouri Valley Conference all-time leading scorer even though this stat started being recorded during the 86 season, so Hawkins' freshman season did not count towards his career total, meaning he unofficially outscored MVC legends such as Oscar Robertson and Larry Bird. Additionally, Hawkins would receive a laundry list of awards, and overall he would finish the season averaging nearly 36.5 points per game, 8 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. Now, I always knew that Hersey Hawkins was one of the all-time great scorers in NCAA history, but what really surprised me in making this video is that Hawkins never averaged below 52% shooting in any of his four years at Bradley, where three of those were spent as a team's top scorer. Add that to the fact that he wasn't a big man who played close to the rim, but instead an undersized two guard that scored from all three levels, just makes his accomplishment even more impressive. Okay, well, it was off to the NBA for Hawkins, but before that, he would be one of the collegiate players selected to play for Team USA at the Seoul Summer Olympics where they would shockingly lose to the Soviet Union, who were a team consisting of all professionals, and they'd only bring home bronze. Part of the reason for this being that Hawkins was injured during this game, and Team USA really missed his outside scoring ability. This loss would also be a large influencing factor on the US sending professionals to the Olympics in 1992. Okay, well back to the draft. It was no surprise that Hawkins was a coveted prospect, and he would be selected 6th overall by the LA Clippers but his rights would immediately be traded to the 76ers in exchange for the rights to his Olympic teammate, Charles Smith. Hawkins would join 76ers superstar Charles Barkley for the 1989 season, as the organization hoped Hawkins could take some of the scoring load and attention off of Barkley. Hawkins would later credit a lot of his early success in the NBA to Barkley's guidance and unwavering confidence in him, as Hawkins would say in a 1991 New York Times article, 
It's kept me sane when I'm shooting bad to have the leader of your team come up to me and say, whenever you get it, you shoot it. It's going to be okay, young fella. Just play hard. So, much like in college, Hawkins would be a starter from day one and would finish the season tied for fourth on the team in scoring. The Sixers would finish with a 10-win improvement from the year before at 46-36, and 36, which was good enough for a playoff berth, where they would lose the Knicks in a three-game sweep. Hawkins would struggle mightily in this series, averaging under three points per game on 12.5% shooting. Hawkins did have a strong regular season though, as he averaged just over 15 points, three rebounds, and three assists per game, and he'd be selected to the all-rookie first team. The 1990 season saw the Sixers improve their record to 53-29, and 29, the best record during Hawkins' time as a Sixer, as well as Hawkins act as the team's second leading scorer on the year. The Sixers would have some playoff success as they made it to the second round, but fell to the Bulls in five. The Sixers' playoff success was largely due to the redemption of Hawkins from the previous year. He would average 23.5 points, good for second on the team behind Barkley's 24.7, and Hawkins would get those points on nearly 50% shooting. Hawkins' playoffs were highlighted by his playoff career high, 39-point performance in the series deciding Game 5 versus the Cavs in the first round. He had avoided a sophomore slump and was really finding his stride in the offense, solidifying himself as an exceptional second option behind Barkley. For the season, Hawkins averaged about 18.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. In 1991, it appeared that the Sixers had taken a step back, as they won 9 less games from the previous year and finished 44-38. and 38. However, this season saw Barkley have his best season up to that point in his career, with 27.5 points and 10 boards per game. Hawkins would also have his best individual season, as he averaged a career-high 22.1 points per game on route to his first and only All-Star selection, as he was selected as a fill-in for an injured Larry Bird, a selection that was met with criticism from the Pistons' general manager but Barkley would come to his teammates' defense in a 1991 New York Times article. The Sixers would return to the playoffs, and after sweeping the Bucks in the first round, would again be beaten by the Bulls in round two. Hawkins would show that his rookie playoff performance was an outlier, as he would average over 20 points on close to 47% shooting in eight games. And for the year, he put up averages of about 22 points, four rebounds, and three and a half assists per game. 1992 saw the Sixers bring out new uniforms, which were short-lived and saw Barkley switch to number 32 for the year in honor of Magic Johnson, who was forced to retire due to an HIV diagnosis. Hawkins was also signed to a four-year, $9 million contract extension prior to the season. The Sixers' offense struggled this year as they finished 20th out of 27 in points per game. This was reflected in their record as they finished 35 and 47 and missed the playoffs. Hawkins would have another solid season as Barkley's sidekick that would see him score a career-high 43 in a win versus the Magic on November 13th. He would end the year averaging about 19 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. However, the future was uncertain in Philly, as Barkley was unhappy and wanted out. During the offseason, Barkley was traded to the Suns for a few players, most notably Jeff Hornacek, who was coming off his best season as a professional in Phoenix, as he averaged 20 points per game. Hornacek, like Hawkins, was an undersized two-guard who could score at all three levels, so it was interesting to see how this combo would work. And it didn't really work as the Sixers went 26-56 and 56 behind an average scoring offense and the fifth worst scoring defense in the league. Hawkins would be the team's leading scorer, the only season of his career in which he led his team in scoring. Hornacek and Hawkins would put up extremely similar stat lines, with Hornacek being a better distributor, averaging three more assists than Hawkins. For the season, Hawkins would average just over 20 points, four and a half rebounds, and four assists per game. The 76ers needed to rebuild and would ship Hawkins to the Charlotte Hornets prior to the 1994 season for players and picks. Hawkins would wear number 32 in his first season in Charlotte as second-year star Alonzo Mourning wore number 33. The Hornets would have a mediocre season due to Mourning and their other star, Larry Johnson, missing a combined 53 games, as they would finish 41-41 and 41 and miss the playoffs. Hawkins was still a starter, but would see his scoring average drop by nearly 6 points, as he would take nearly 4 less shot attempts per game than he was taking in Philly. For the season, Hawkins would average about 14.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. He would also have the second highest scoring output of his career in a February 9th game versus the Warriors where he scored 41 points. 1995 saw Hawkins switch from number 32 to number 3 and have a similar offensive output from the year before, but a healthy Hornets team went 50-32 and, and made the playoffs, marking the first time Hawkins would be in the playoffs since 1991, but they would lose to Chicago in the first round. Hawkins would have an inconsistent playoff series though, as he averaged nearly 48% shooting in the first two games and 33% shooting in the last two games. He also only scored more than 8 points twice in the series. For the year, Hawkins would have about 14.5 points, 4 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. 
The 1995 offseason saw Hawkins traded to the Seattle Supersonics along with David Wingate in exchange for former Hornet Kendall Gill. Gill was a solid scorer for the Sonics, but after a strong Sonics team had finished 57 and 25 during the 95 season, they were knocked out in the first round of the playoffs, and Gill's 6 points per game and 25% three-point shooting didn't help. But much like Hawkins had already shown in his career, he was a master at finding his place and flowing within the offense. Hawkins was one of four Sonic starters to average over 15 points per game and fit in perfectly alongside All-Stars Gary Payton and Sean Kemp. The Sonics finished the year 64-18, and which was good for first place in the West, and made it all the way to the NBA Finals before losing the 72-10 Chicago Bulls. Hawkins would see his scoring role decrease for the third time in three teams, but it was because he was on a well-established team where he would do whatever was needed on any given night, which was highlighted in a March 12th article. Additionally, this article talked to Hawkins about his title as nice guy on the team, which he didn't really agree with as he felt that as a competitor, being a nice guy is not a compliment. For the season, Hawkins would average about 15.5 points, 3.5 rebounds, and 2.5 assists per game. 1997 saw similar regular season success for the Sonics as they finished 57-25, and but would lose to the Houston Rockets and Hawkins' former teammate and mentor Charles Barkley in the second round in seven games. Hawkins would perform well in the playoffs, but Barkley and Elijah inside presence and Gary Payton's poor second round shooting would contribute to the Sonics loss. For the year, Hawkins would average about 14 points, 4 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Prior to the 1998 season, there were major changes in Seattle, as Kemp was sent to the Cavs in a three-team deal in which the Sonics received all-star forward Vin Baker. As far as production goes, this wasn't much of a change. But in regards to playstyle, it was, as Kemp was more of a transition and slashing big man who relied on his freakish athleticism, where Baker was more of your traditional low post player. And Baker had a solid first season in Seattle, averaging about 19 points and 8 rebounds, and the Sonics would finish 61 and 21. But they would lose to the up and coming LA Lakers in the second round of the playoffs, where Hawkins once again provided a modest but reliable scoring contribution. The 1999 season was a disappointment for the Sonics particularly due to Vin Baker's rapid decline because of struggles with alcohol abuse. The lockout shortened season saw Seattle go 25-25 and 25 and miss the playoffs. Hawkins' first time missing the playoffs since the 94 season. Hawkins would play in all 50 games, but only start 34 of them, and he would struggle with his efficiency this season, as he shot just under 42%. He would average about 10.5 points, 4 rebounds, and 2.5 assists for the season. One highlight of the season would be that Hawkins was honored for being the consummate pro that he always was, as he was awarded the 1999 NBA Sportsmanship Award, becoming the first Supersonic to win the award. Hawkins was traded in the offseason to his hometown Chicago Bulls. Hawkins was recognized by GM Jerry Krause for his scoring versatility as well as his ability as a defender, but it also seemed that Hawkins was brought in to be a veteran role model for a young Bulls team, who had just picked up Elton Brand and Ron Artest in the NBA draft. Hawkins had a bit of a disappointing 2000 season, as his body was beginning to break down. He would only play in 61 games, marking the first time in his career where he would play less than 79 games in a season, and he'd finish with averages of about 8 points, 3 rebounds, and 2 assists per game on 42% shooting for a 17-65 and 65 Bulls team. Hawkins would return to Charlotte for the 2001 season on a free agent deal where he would play 59 games in a bench role for a 46-36 and 36 Hornets team who lost in the second round of the playoffs to the Bucks. Hawkins would play a very limited role in the playoffs, only seeing the court for 6 out of 10 games. In the regular season, Hawkins would average about 3 points, 1.5 rebounds, and 1 assist per game on less than 41% shooting. Hawkins would quietly retire from the league after the season, bringing an end to a very respectable 13-year career. Hawkins made it abundantly clear during his Bradley days that he could score and be the guy, yet he was drafted to a situation where he was the sidekick to the guy as a secondary option. Hawkins could have complained and forced himself out, but he took on this role exceptionally, and it shaped the way he would be used throughout his career. He was never the star of the team, but could put up star numbers on any night, and his ability to keep the defense honest opened up the floor and complemented the skill set of all the all-star big men that he played with. Hawkins' success was predicated on not only his playstyle, but also his character, as he was a valued and respected member of every team he played on. One more thing that hasn't been highlighted as much as it should have been in this video was that Hawkins was no slouch on the defensive end, as he averaged 1.7 steals per game over his career. Additionally, he was a knockdown free throw shooter with a career 87% free throw average. So that's it for Hersey Hawkins, one of the great forgotten players of the 90s and one of the most underrated scorers of all time. I hope you enjoyed today's video and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this one. See you next time.